Okay, so I'd like to formally welcome all of you today. Good afternoon to all of our Leadership Collier Foundation alumni and guests. And welcome to our Leadership Collier Foundation's Leadership Lunch series. Thank you so much for joining us today. As most of you know, the mission of the Leadership Collier Foundation is to activate the potential of leaders in build it, building a stronger Collier County. And as a part of that mission, we work continuously to educate and engage community leaders like you. And I'm thrilled to have such an esteemed panel with us today as we focus on an important topic in leadership. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to the chair of our Leadership Collier Foundation's Leadership Lunch Committee, Sonia Diaz, to take our introductions from here. So Sonia. Hi, thank you everybody and welcome. I'm so glad you can all join us today. I see so many faces I recognize, so many, so many of our leaders are here with us today. Today, we are going to hear from three inspiring leaders in their fields who are going to discuss their paths and experiences as women leaders. Um, I say three because Senator Pasadomo has been called to duty today in appropriations meetings and unfortunately will not be joining us on our panel. However, we are, are very fortunate to have with us today Chief Stephanie Spell, who will moderate a conversation with Adria Starkey and Kathleen Van Bergen about their paths to leadership. And I, I know many of you already know our panelists, and I am truncating their accomplishments tremendously, given the amount of time that we have allotted, but just want to give a brief bio of each of them. Kathleen Van Bergen is now in her 10th season as CEO and president of Helm of Artists, Naples. Her oversight is recognized throughout the community and in the greater arts community as an example of leadership geared towards prudent growth and relationship building. Gulf Shore Life Magazine named her one of its 2012 Men and Women of the Year, suggesting that her title should be expanded to be Collaborator in Chief. And in 2016, Naples Illustrator named her, Illustrated named her one of its leading ladies, saying that in less than five years, she has led Naples' premier cultural center to a new level. She has been named one of Musical America's top 30 professionals of the year in 2019, and has been described as a woman with a mission, a vision, and a board to support both. Adria D. Starkey is the Collier County President for Finemark National Bank and Trust. Adria has three decades of experience in financial services and her community service and involvement is extensive. She was reappointed by Governor Rick Scott to the Florida Prepaid College Board. She's chair of the Healthcare Network Development and Community Awareness Committee and serves on the Gulf Shore Life Advisory Board. In addition, she is a lifetime trustee of the Naples Children and Education Foundation. She co-chaired the 2014 Winter Wine Festival and has served on their grant committee for four years. She has been named Woman of the Year by Gulf Shore Life Magazine, Woman of Achievement by the Community Foundation, and the recognition goes on. We are very grateful to have her here today. Chief Stephanie Spell will serve as our moderator today. Chief Spell has been with the Collier County Sheriff's Office since 1987. She currently heads the Community Engagement Department within the Collier County Sheriff's Office. And as a member of Sheriff Kevin Rambosk's Executive Command Staff, she provides leadership for several different law enforcement bureaus. Chief Spell is also actively involved in our community, having served as president of the Board of Directors of Youth Haven, she currently serves on the board of directors of the Collier Resource Center and as a committee member of Greater Naples Leadership. Chief Spell, and, and this is something I should know as a lawyer but didn't learn until preparing, um, Chief Spell has also served on the Grievance Committee of the Florida Bar, which is a big job, and is a graduate of the FBI National Academy's Florida Executive Development Center. She's a graduate of Leadership Collier, Greater Naples Leadership, and Leadership Florida. Um, Another interesting fact about Chief Spell is that she's a watercolor artist, an accomplished outdoors woman who enjoys fly fishing, skeet shooting, and adventure travel. So um, Chief Spell, with that introduction and, and our panelists, thank you in advance. I'd like to turn it over to you, Chief Spell, to begin our conversation. Thank you, Sonia, and, and welcome to, to everyone. I, it's such an honor to participate in this discussion today with, uh, with 
uh, leaders that I respect and admire and, and uh, I'm just thrilled to be here and to do this with, uh, with all of you, my uh, dear friends and community colleagues. So thank you. So the format today is I have several questions that I'm going to ask each of our panelists. And, um, but we, we all agree that we really want to hear your questions. So Amanda has, uh, will be facilitating your questions uh, when we wrap up with a couple of questions that I'm gonna kick off with. Uh, and if you will put those in the chat box and then uh, when we turn it over to your questions, which will be uh, really the, 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 the meat of, of this discussion, um, she will read them from the chat. So Adria, I'd like to start with you and ask you, as a leader, what has been the most significant accomplishment in your career? So thank you, first of all, to everyone for inviting me, including me. I am uh, so excited to see some of the faces, the smiling faces on this screen, because I miss many of you um, very much. I haven't seen you in a long time. And I feel like, uh, honestly, I, I am very much a part of all of you. So I don't feel like my leadership capabilities are any different or greater than so many of the people in the, on this screen right now. When you talk about greatest accomplishments, I guess I'm hoping they're yet to come. Uh, but today I would tell you by far, and this isn't career, so it's not exactly, but I, I've never been good at discerning career from my life. It is all one and I work very diligently to keep things, all the balls in the air. My, by far the greatest thing is my family, my children, and that they are producing. And they're all like producing today and making this world a better place. So by far, that's the most important thing that I've brought forward to this, this uh, world. With regard to my career, I love startups. I've always loved startups. And my history of startups really goes back from when I was young. Um, my father bought some businesses. Uh, franchise type businesses so I could be employed. And I started a lot of small businesses and I love that. It taught me such an entrepreneurial spirit. I kept that with me. Uh, one of the first times in the corporate world, I remember a startup was when I worked for Northern Trust, I started in Miami when Northern Trust had their opened their first office in Florida. And it was very exciting. I remember the headhunter calling me and I'm going, Northern Trust? That's kind of an oxymoron. Who's Northern Trust? And so I had to do my homework and I ended up working for this amazing company that brought me to Naples many years later. But I was working in Miami and you know we wrote the loan policy. We started the whole bank. It was just a very interesting opportunity. And I I learned to love startups. I love starting new businesses. I love taking things and really creating them. So I would say that's probably the best thing that I offer is I like to cover a lot of various things. And that, that's where I've really seen um, me add value to the companies that I've worked for. So I would consider that. Great, thank you so much. And Kathleen, the same question. As a leader, what has been the most significant accomplishment in your career? Uh, I have to echo Adria partially to say that I hope the best is yet to come. Um, but um, all jokes aside, in an organization that is built on large communal experiences, navigating a pandemic has to be pretty high at the top of a list. <laughs> um, I think. It's a pleasure to see everyone today. I love that there are men and women on this call and thank you all for being here and prioritizing the topic. It means a great deal to be able to express my opinions and I think Adria and I will complement one another in many ways. I marvel at anyone who can start anything, be a founder, be someone who starts something down here from the sand up, that is not my skill set. Um, I am someone who likes to grow, shape, deepen, build, but I have no idea how people have talents and skills that can literally take an idea and turn it into something. I am much more about um, adding value when there's a second or third chapter to be defined. And if I had to choose something, 
I would say that following a pretty remarkable woman who was a founder here, Myra Jenko Daniels, um, over 10 years, uh, comprehensively raising over $150 million and starting to solidify with many, many other people, partnerships, commitments all around, starting to solidify Naples as a, a true cultural community. One that is not only known for our beaches and our weather and our um, shopping and our dining, golf, but really prioritizing arts and culture as part of the identity of this community. And I hope my work is not yet done. And especially after this year, one of the things I'm taking away is the validation of how much people miss gathering in communal artistic experiences. So um, I hope that, hope that helps to give an idea of who I am and how I add value. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Adria, and you know, when, when Sonia and Amanda and I talked about these questions, we, we kind of struggled about this next one because it, it's asking for um, experience as a, as a female leader. And you know, we, we all recognize that that's, that's the only perspective you have as a female leader. And, you know, and, and would we ask this question as of a male leader? Um, but I think it's important and it's relative to the topic today. So I'm gonna ask it. Do you believe you ever experienced any barriers or obstacles as a female leader in your industry? So Chief Spell, I have to say, I also looked at the question and said, I really wish we'd stop asking this question yes. <laughs> because I'd like us all to be in the place where it's not this because I'm a woman or this because I'm whatever the case might be. I'm sure I am absolutely positive that I could give you examples of things where I experienced differences. And, but I'm not sure that those differences were necessarily because I'm a woman. My first job out of college I went to work for a company called American Hospital Supply Company. I've really done a lot of different things, have not always been in the banking business, but age has allowed me to have lots of different roads to travel down. So I went to work for a company based in um, Evanston, Illinois, called American Hospital Supply. I was the first woman they ever hired to be in their educational and um, educational and environmental division. And I was basically a salesman. And how I was trained was I went with a bunch of other salesmen to go on sales calls. They did not know what to do with me. They didn't know when we traveled, should they be nice and pick up my luggage or not pick up my luggage. There were so many weird little things that happened. And I know I made them uncomfortable. So I was always tried to kind of, okay, I can fit in, but I was different. And um, I had to work through those differences. I will tell you as much as they were concerned about my differences, I also was able to get in to see all kinds of people because people wanted to see purchasing agents. And I was traveling primarily the Eastern coastline, but I could be in New York and then New Jersey and then Florida, all over the place. And they wanted to see me because they had never seen a woman that come in to see the purchasing agents. And I think I was like, like a circus clown or something. They wanted the novel experience. Let's invite the woman in to see what she looks like. As bad as that sounds, you know, I got in the door and I was able to get some deals done as a result and work hard to um, have that experience. I had another time my first banking job, a gentleman clearly called up after I met him for the first time. He called my boss and said, I don't want the young rookie girl covering my business. My, my account is just far too important. And I don't want the young rookie girl. I was young and I was new. And so my boss was great, told me directly instead of beating around the bush. And um, I was hell-bent that I was going to get this guy to like me. And I will tell you, he, I think he moved to three banks with me. He came to my wedding. He became a great client. And um, we are still very close friends today. So it, it was just, 
I, after you know a few years, I told him, you really did not make me very happy with your comment and I'm proving myself. But I think everybody has to do that. Well, no matter if you're male or female, you have to prove your worth, go out and do what you say you're gonna do, have integrity, do the right thing. And it all comes around. So I'm sure there were many other examples. I just have chosen not to look at things from a male, female perspective. And I've really tried to live my life that way and it's made it a lot easier. I, I fear that women who look at everything as, um, as let's argue about this or let's fight about this, it just drags you down. Um, I, I've done a lot of research. I think a lot of people know I, I try to educate women about financial matters. It's very important to me. And I've actually done a lot of research about the wage disparity between women and men, and it is real. But I know in our company, we actually do a salary assessment and I want to see it so I can verify that we are paying women the same wage as we are paying a man in that job. And I think I would be shocked if there were companies in our country that are doing differently. I really believe that. I think that oftentimes women choose positions that may be paid less or they don't ask for raises. I know this for a fact. They do not ask for raises in the same way. They do not walk in and say, what can I do to get a larger bonus? How can I do more? What else can I take on? And I have men walk in all the time and ask me those questions. They have no qualms about it. So I try to reach, you know, talk to women that talk to me and say, please, you've got to ask. You have to be bold and step forward. And you have to make a difference where you are. You have to speak up and be engaged. And I think we are seeing women step forward in every regard. There's, I mean, it, this year, more women are in every postgraduate degree than men. Everyone except computer science and engineering. Those are the only two areas. So we're going to see this continue to benefit women over time. We just have to work hard to ask women to be strong enough and confident enough to step forward. Those are my, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you know, I really appreciate that you embraced the situations that you were in and but remained very authentic to yourself and and I think that's that's a big key of of um, developing your career too and thank you for your work in in wage parity that's very important and we really appreciate that Kathleen um, do you believe that you've ever experienced any barriers or obstacles as a female leader in your industry um, I'm sure I have, but there is nothing that I feel specifically held me back. Um, I will say in the nonprofit sector, uh, there are major progress has been made with female leadership. My concern is that it is only going to remain in the nonprofit sector. And of course, we want female leadership to be supported across every industry. But I have had the great privilege of having both male and female mentors help me get to where I am in um, defining my style and defining my goals as a, an administrator, an executive, and as a, a female leader. Uh, I have to give credit to my dad. Growing up in a household where my dad is arguably more of a feminist than my mom, I think I started life with assumptions that he would say regularly, girls can do anything boys can do, and my mom would always pipe in better. So um, that was the environment in which I was was taught and raised at home. And it does translate into raising your hand in school and speaking up for something you believe in. And then when you're in the professional environment, making sure that you are voicing your philosophy, your integrity, your priorities. I think that prior to my world as um, an administrator and arts executive, I was a violinist and I performed professionally um, in the United States and in Europe. And as an artist, you have to have an opinion. You communicate it through a different um, tool. It's not always a voice, it's sometimes a, an instrument. But I think having the expectations of clear communication, what is it you're trying to say, whether it's in a business side, an artistic side, um, a community message. I have, I have been very fortunate to grow up in an environment um, personally and professionally where my voice was respected, whether or not 
I was male or female. Um, just for a little lighthearted moment, I will share that all of us can help being equals in the workplace. The workplace involves travel, the workplace involves dining. Um, as Adria mentioned, someone being a gentleman, um, chivalry still is very fine with me. Picking up my bag, opening a door, I have no problem with, with a gentleman being a gentleman. But one of the situations I'll share that I still chuckle about is when I was traveling with a male colleague, the assumption was that um, we were sharing hotel rooms. And it was very clear that this was a business trip and there were two reservations. And then the question was, do you need adjoining rooms? Uh, no, actually, would you please put us on separate floors? That would be the most comfortable way of traveling with a colleague. And I do find that that humor, um, we all have to figure out what is our style? How are we going to make light in those situations and not let it to affect our professional relationships? I, I don't know if um, men have the same experience, but I've had plenty of people try to set me up Oh, I know this man, Kathleen, he's great. He's tall, he's successful. And um, usually I ask if he's funny and that ends the conversation, unfortunately. But I think there are different, different comfort levels, not only from within your business team, but how you interact with the public and the expectations placed on us. Um, and then finally, I will say I was in the artistic world. Sometimes our travels are overseas and it's great responsibility to travel and try and build a partnership with an organization that's not in our country, but you're also um, affected then by different cultures. And I remember a very difficult moment where my colleague was introducing, uh, being introduced to others and the assumption was that he was the CEO and um, he handled it beautifully and directed it quite comfortably by reintroducing me but I think we're all in this together and we have to figure out ways that we can um, either make light of a situation or very clearly establish where the protocols are. Yes, yep, great great stories and, and thank you for sharing, sharing those. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Kathleen about uh, having a voice and that, that's a, a great segue into our next question. Adria, at what point did you find your voice in your career? So if I may first go back, Kathleen, your comments were so on target. And I have to say, it was also my father that probably gave me my voice. So it, I could segue into that. But um, he, I, I grew up in a household where I was told all the time I, I could do whatever I wanted. And I felt unconditional love and support. And so I will say, I feel many women that I talked to did not, that come to me either in mentoring situations. I've, I've had, I've been blessed with many great women that I've worked with over the years. And oftentimes they haven't had that experience. I think that does add, um, it really helps. It gives you a good foundation and you have to work even harder to have that self-confidence if you did not grow up in a household that gave you that type of support. So I, I just wanted to go back and acknowledge that because I think it's so important and it ties right into having, having your voice and then utilizing your voice in the right way. Um, I, I remember very clearly the first time I was told to use my voice. I, I really, um, it was one of my early days in, this, in the banking business and there was a gentleman that was running a training program and he called me in his office and proceeded to say very nice things to me, you know, when you get all the nice things, but there's going to be a but someplace. And of course, I'm just listening for the but. I'm not hearing the other, the other nice things he's saying. But the but was, Adria, you're not, you're not speaking up. You're not using your voice. You know, you know all of this, you know what you you're doing, you have great ideas, you need to speak up. And then he said something which to this day I struggle with. He said, even if you don't know what you're talking about, just, just say it. You're, you're gonna get it right most of the time. And I think to myself, I have to be honest, I thought I would never do that. I have to know what I'm talking about before I'm going to say it. But I think his lesson really made me start thinking and start thinking about my voice and the importance of speaking up and being heard. 
I will tell you the next time, I, I, I always thought about that, but then the next time I had this aha moment was I had risen to a, to a higher place in my career than I thought I would have, honestly, than I had ever planned to. Um, and I was going to get divorced. And I was in a position where um, my former husband was um, very well compensated, so I didn't need to work. I was working because I loved what I do and I've always worked. I, but I thought, a long, I thought long and hard about this because I thought I might lose my voice because all of a sudden I have to support myself and support my children and make sure that I can take care of everyone. And I might be afraid to use my voice for fear of maybe I'll really screw up. Maybe people won't like what I say and I could lose my, just a lot of negative talk went through my head during that kind of difficult transition in my life. And I really had to regroup, uh, kind of pull up my pants and say, okay, I got this. I'm just gonna be me. And wherever the cards fall, they're going to fall. But I have to share what I think is important with people. And, you know, those are diff oftentimes um, the people that get ahead, I think, are the people who know how to handle difficult conversations. They are, that's where the learning comes in. It's where the employee conversation that you don't want to have, but where you can really make a difference, or the client that is acting a certain way or the donor or the person that you have to deal with where you have to have the difficult conversation. That's where you have to really use your voice. And if you back down, you're, you're, you're just, you're not doing the right thing for the company you're representing yourself personally. Just So I, I just, it was a real aha for me that I had to keep using my voice. It is crucial. And women, need to work on this skill. I believe it is like a muscle. You work out your muscles every single day. Otherwise, your muscles start, especially at my age, they start to go the other direction. So we have to use our muscles. This is just another muscle. And I, I think it's in my gut. I don't know where it lives, but I really believe you have to use your voice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Great points. And uh, I just wanted to mention that the other day I, I read a fabulous article in Harvard, Harvard Business Review that spoke about how to develop uh, what they call the executive voice. And um, but what is equally as important in developing your executive voice is developing your executive presence. Uh, and that, that was a really interesting concept to me. And uh, if anybody has access to the, the Harvard Business Review, it was an excellent, excellent article. Thank you. Kathleen, Thank you. at what point did you find your voice during your career? Uh, it's a great question. And thank you, Adria, for sharing so authentically. Um, I'm going to try and embody that same honesty. When I reflected a little bit on this question, it was very clear to me that when I shifted my identity from being, hi, I'm Kathleen, I play the violin, to being on the other side, on the management arts administration side, I definitely had to find my voice. It was a new voice. Um, but if I'm sincere, I thought I had my voice at two different points in my career when I had not actually found my voice. I had technique. Uh, I mean, vocabulary, not, not musical technique. I'm talking about executive technique. I had the skills, I had knowledge, I had all these tools in my toolbox, but I had not yet figured out um, who I wanted to be stylistically, presence-wise. Um, how would I express empathy? When would I display my real core values as a leader? So if I were to say, oh, I, I achieved my voice when I was named vice president of the Philadelphia Orchestra at 28 years old, blah, blah, blah. Most people would stay in that job for decades. That was not actually sincere. Um, I also went through a divorce and found my voice after working through all of those changes. Um, I feel that when I became the artistic and executive director at the Schubert Club in St. Paul, that was the first time that I really put together all of those technical tools 
the maturity, um, the goals, who was I as a person, and what did I have to surround myself with, meaning talents of the team, um, continued learning. That was really when I felt um, it was it was very clear. Until then I had the platform, but I did not yet really have my voice. And now I feel that as a female leader, all of us have the responsibility to create that atmosphere where others can find their voice. I, I hope that it's still a developing muscle. I hope that we're always learning new things and the world changes and culture changes and expectations change. And so I hope that my voice does continue to mature and respond and be additive. Um, but right now I am focused on, especially during a pandemic when there's very little human to human interaction, um, it feels precious. I'm trying to spend more energy creating a space for others to um, find their voice as well. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, I, I just read another article, you can tell I, I'm, I'm a voracious reader, um, but it, it, uh, a, a female leader said that Early on in her career, you you know it's, it's up to early on in anyone's career, it's up to you to produce your own work product. But at some point in your career, it becomes not about you anymore. It's about how you engage with and empower others. And I think that that's that's part of finding your voice and finding your presence is 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 that connection. It's a great, great, great answer. And don't mind. There are some times where I look back and I wish my voice had been muted over my career. <laughs> there are some examples where we would like to just tone that down, yes. but um, chalk it up to growth. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Adria, what advice would you give to the next generation? And, and we, we originally phrased this question, what advice would you give to the next generation of female leaders? But I'm going to rephrase that. What advice would you give to the next generation of leaders? Um, I'm gonna go back first, if you don't mind, I promise I'll answer that, but I do want to acknowledge, uh, and I guess maybe it could be part of this question also. The, my advice, um, or the thing I was just gonna say, was your your mentors, and I don't like that word necessarily, your, there are lots of people you can learn from. They are all around you. And I think it's really important. And everyone is not going to fit every piece, but using, using the people that are there and in your life and in your workplace and in whatever your social groups you can learn so much from others. And I think that it really adds a lot of value and having, seeking out other people that really matter. And I, I've been doing some work on, um, talked to some people at FGCU about developing a personal board of directors. And I've never, I never, I, I can't say that I have like this personal board of directors but it's such a cool idea to think about the people who are best in class in all the things you want to be and then utilizing them and um, bouncing things off of them, acknowledging them. I can see people on this screen right now that I have turned to and some of you know who you are, so I could learn from you. And um, I think that that's a really important thing to do, find the people. And it's not just where you are today, but where do you wanna to get to tomorrow? I remember certainly seeking out people who I thought were much better mothers than I was, so I could be a better mother or a better um, anything. Anything I wanted to do, I'd seek out people who could and who could help me. So I do think that focusing on being the best you can be and then putting a good team of people around yourself. I've been so fortunate. There is no way I, I would have been in, certainly involved in the community as much. I have certain people in this town that for 30 years, they have been pulling me along and saying, I want you on this board. You need to be on this board. You need to do this. And they've taken my hand and taken me to the best places and I trust them. 
Trust is very important to me. Integrity is crucial. You have to you have to have that that same hold yourself to those same standards. Um, I also have to say, any young person, hold on. I think of all these things, you know, like juggling the balls or the plates that are flying around, and you're trying to keep them all going. Hold on to the glass ball. You can screw up the other ones. You can drop a ball, but you've got to hold on to the glass ball. And to me, that's my family. I I could work a lot of hours, but I was at soccer games. Um, I did. I was there for my kids, and that mattered a ton. And they are extremely thankful for that. I I, I can say not to go on, but I was um, the president of First Union. And I was in a very fortunate position, first union, and then it became Wachovia. And Ken Thompson, who was the CEO of the entire company, uh, would ask me to be on the calls when we were going to talk to the analyst so I could be a part of coaching some of the conversation. Anyway, um, I had, before I joined this company, in my contract, I put in writing that I would be attending my children's sporting events or anything else that was pertinent to them because I wanted to be there. That didn't mean I would be doing less work that day. That just meant that I would be doing it at a different time. I would get my stuff done, but I, I was making this a priority. Um, he used that as a company wide thing. And he would joke about, we're gonna have an analyst call tomorrow, but I have to go to my kid's baseball game because Adria told me it was okay to do that. And I took great pride in that. So I ask all of you to really put what's most important to you at the top of your to-do list and keep it there and keep working on it and be um, authentic and sincere with the people that are around you. Treat them all with dignity and respect. And I think that good things happen as a result of that over and over. So I think I've taken too much time, but thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And you know, one of the questions that we vowed not to ask was, you know, how do you balance uh, all the things that that uh, there's no woman, balance? Yeah, that there, there, there is no balance. And um, but I, I love that you put those stipulations in a in a contract. That was that was brilliant. Great. Uh, and, and Kathleen, wh what advice would you give to the next generation of leaders? Um, well, one of them is that there is no such thing as balance. My sister and I have created very different definitions of family. Um, I am not married. I don't have children. My sister is an MD, PhD, works tirelessly, has a husband who also works and three boys, eight, six, and two. And I am the best aunt, of course. Uh, but we have very different definitions of family. And she's constantly striving for this balance. And I have repeatedly said, whether you define family as friends and loved ones who are near and far, or you define family as your husband, your parents, your aunts, uncles, children, there, there's no such thing as balance. It's, it's an unattainable goal, but we can have different priorities at different times and we can consciously identify what we're going to protect. That glass ball analogy is a beautiful one. There might be certain points in a year or a five-year period or a 10-year period where there's something really personally valuable that needs to be a priority. Um, and so when I'm looking at the next generation of leaders and current leaders, I think we have to celebrate that how we define family, how we um, define what our needs are might be different for those of us, whether we're managing one person responsible for 200 or 2000 people. Um, I hope that our example at Artist Naples is met with um, differing definitions of people being able to create those spaces and priorities and still be really successful in their, in their work. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that while I have also strived for balance and been unsuccessful, I do know that when I invest time in myself, when I do something that fuels me, not just fuels me professionally, but fuels me personally, um, everything else seems to be just a little bit easier. And so whether it's 15 minutes to just sit outside with not a device around me or um, putting my toes in the sand more often than I should, even though we all live so close to it. I find that a little bit of fuel in my personal self uh, makes me um, much more pleasant to be around and much more productive. 
excellent advice and something that I've uh, embraced only in the last couple of years too. And it, it really does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. Ladies, thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom, for being so genuine and open with us. We, we really appreciate it. I've learned so much. Thank you. You're, you're a great inspiration. And Amanda, I think at this point, it'd be great to hear from our participants uh, what, the, what they would like Adria and, and Kathleen to answer. Thank you so much. So as a reminder, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and this way I will know that you have a question. Um, I'd also like to make it interactive. So if you, um, when I call on you, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. So we have one from Kath, Kath, Kelly Townsend. Um, are you with us and able to ask your question? I'll wait for a moment and if not, then I'll ask it for you. Hi, nice to see everyone today. It's so great to be with you, Adrienne. It's great to meet you, Kathleen. Uh, my question is, what are some of the most important lessons that you've learned as a leader during the pandemic? Because, you know, no one had ever been here before, right? And I'd love to hear what the lessons that you've learned. Do you want me to start? I think that would be good to keep the same order. Okay. Okay. Uh, great to see you, Kelly. I've been enjoying what looking at you. Um, <laughs> So yes, uh, when I reflect back on a year ago right now, we were all in a bit of shock at this point. Um, I will tell you the things that have been most important to uh, me in the current role that I'm in, getting my arms around my employees, making sure they were okay, really getting in people's faces. Everyone came to this pandemic with a different mindset. It, the mindsets were different. And we had to figure out very quickly how to run a business and do it for the most part remotely. This is something I had never experienced previously. It was amazing as to how well it all worked. Uh, but I will say that um, it, was, um, it was not easy. And it was a lot. At last year at this time, we were just round the clock. I was fortunate. I was able to be here every day. I've been here every day through this whole thing. I never worked remotely. Um, we needed a core team of people. And we had a small group that kind of, you know, we all cut our fingers and bled together and said, we are going to stay healthy. And we did. The only people who ever got the coronavirus were people working remotely. Um, so now I have everybody back, but we worked diligently, always trying to communicate. I think we had to communicate so much more so the people at home could feel a part of this and be included. So I'd say constant communication, constantly trying to stay ahead of CDC guidelines, what's the best thing to do. We brought in people, we tested all of our employees right here, we were having our own little drive-by. We did antibody tests for all of our employees. Um, we did everything we could. We fed our people every day that were here so they never had to leave. We were doing whatever we could to try to keep our people as engaged and happy and healthy as possible, whether they were here or at home. It's the best we could do at the time. And thank God we live where we live because it's just been a boom to our business. So thank you for asking, Kelly. It's a great question, Kelly. Um, our business is still not yet back. Uh, we are following CDC guidelines. And I'm a firm believer that people get things done with other people. So defining together was really important when we were not physically together. Like Adria, I was part of the essential team that was going in um, into the office physically. But what I will take away from the pandemic is that one is external. We had to make decisions that would be trusting of our audiences, trusting from the community. From 13 months ago, when we suddenly faced five plus million dollars in canceled activities and seven plus million dollars of people's ticketing dollars on account, there were some who wanted refunds, but there were others who trusted that next year we'd be back. We went into the pandemic financially strong and artistically strong, and we made decisions, some very difficult ones, 
to make sure we'd come out of the pandemic artistically and financially strong. And then when we were finally able to reopen our doors, both in the Baker Museum and in Hayes Hall for the Naples Philharmonic, the trust once again was paramount. We had to create protocols that were true to the experience that people were buying a ticket and believing they would have. Face masks, temperature checks, social distancing. We are still at 25% capacity, so we're following the CDC guidelines. And I know many of you have ventured out either a simulcast in the Norris Garden or inside in the museum or Hayes Hall. And thank you for trusting that we will keep your health a top priority. We invested half a million dollars in new HVAC system, a bipolar ionization system, again, for trust. But the two external elements, one is validation that people miss what we do and they miss it in their lives. Whether it's distributed digitally, it's still not the same. There's a reason we have records, but we still go to concerts. There's a reason we watch sports on TV, but we still wanna be at the game. And then the other one is I hope we take away the same commitment to experimenting, our desire to the show must go on, make things happen. There's no reason that a crisis should um, just have those emotions and those really fruitful decision-making skills that we've now learned. I hope we take those things into life post-pandemic when we can um, implement them in a much more stable environment. And if anyone knows when this will truly be over, I would really appreciate a phone call because uh, we're trying to plan for next season. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I have a lot of questions coming through both in messages and chats. So um, I'm just going to read the first one that I see here now. And I'll, I, I'm sorry, it's the last one, but I'll go back. But I see one that's uh, Nikki Dvorak, if you're able to unmute. Thank you. And thank you guys again for your time today. It's been it's been really helpful and wonderful. So my question is, have you ever been in a position where you had a leader that either maybe was intimidated by you, um, intimidated by you, or maybe not receptive to you, you know, having a voice and showing leadership and could possibly have stifled your growth a little bit in your career? And how did you handle that? Oh. I, yes, I did have that experience. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure that it was the best way to handle it, but you could only bounce your head against the wall so many times. And so I left the company. Um, and that's not how I'd really like to be able to do things. But at my parting, the parting remarks were, um, as I was having my exit interview, he said to me, it's about time you're going to stay home and take care of your kids. And I just said, yes, yes, it is. Thank you very much. And, you know, I had something to do about four days later, but just had to say goodbye. Sorry, Adria, that's horrible. Um, I also had that experience, but it was with another woman. And I have to say that I, I had been internally promoted which is very hard. That is one of the most difficult, I think male woman, anyone, male, female, it is a difficult thing to be internally promoted and find peers now reporting to you. Um, so my challenge was with another um, who I considered friend and colleague, but it definitely shifted. And we had a couple of heavy conversations. We were able to work things out, um, but ultimately we didn't make the best team and um, she's the one who left, not me, but unfortunately. We're much better working together. I don't care where we come from. We're all stronger together, that's for sure. Thank you both. I have uh, some uh, some people nudging me to make sure I ask Brian Herrick's question. And I'm sorry, Brian, that I missed that. I'm going back up. Um, Brian, your question has been well received by a lot of the women on this call. So if you're able to unmute, you can ask your question. Good, night, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you, Adria and Kathleen. Uh, my question is, what is the best way or ways a husband can support a wife with career and or family goals? So either or or both, this, I guess, is what I'm wondering. I'm a, I'm a new father, and I have a three-month-old daughter, so yeah. Well, you're, uh, first of all, thank you for asking the question. I just told someone yesterday, one of the most important things you can do as a woman if you're going to get married, you have to pick the right spouse because it could be deadly to your career if you don't pick the right spouse. Um, so I would say a supportive husband is just somebody who's got your back 
sometimes I taught my husband to um, just say, ah, but I preface the conversation often. I'll go home and say, okay, I need to talk to you about this. I really don't want his advice. I just want him to say, ah, and so, but I tell him in advance so he knows the kind of conversation I'm having. And then I say, I'm gonna tell you this, but just say, ah, when I'm done, because he really will wanna fix it. And I, I'm, I can fix my own stuff. I don't need anybody to fix it, but I love to have somebody say, oh, I'm so sorry for you. And then if I think as a father, I'm very fortunate right now, I have a son who has a four month old daughter that I'm going to see again tomorrow. And so um, it's so great to see fathers so engaged with children now. That's not honestly how it was um, 30 some years ago. So I am really so excited about men and their daughters. Your daughter, you will be her hero. And you heard both Kathleen and I talk about the importance that fathers had in our life. So I encourage men to take a strong stand in supporting women, women's issues and really being there for your daughter and tell her every day she can do anything she wants to do. Thank you. Are you willing to hear some feedback from a non-married woman on this? Okay, um, the marriages that I see most successful, um, I love that they prioritize who is at a critical point in their career path. They actually talk about it. And they'll say, well, I'm just gonna stay here right now because so-and-so, the spouse partner, um, has an opportunity. And I think that's really important that you're ambitious for each other, but also thinking about whose time is when. And one pet peeve I have in um, looking, I have a lot of little people, young people in my life. And when I listen to their parents talk, a pet peeve I have is that sometimes they blame things on one another's jobs instead of talking in the positive about what the job career role does for the family. And I think if you can find ways to complement your wife's profession and in a positive way say, well, she can't be here, but look at what her job is doing for us. I think that's really a beautiful marriage when I see people positively encouraging um, even to their children. Thank you so much. Um, I think we will have time for maybe one more question and one uh, last response from each. Um, so I have one I see here privately, but it's for all from Stephanie Driscoll. Unless Stephanie, you'd like me to ask. I certainly uh, don't mind asking that. Thanks, uh, Amanda, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, so I, this is a question for the panel. And um, I come to this question because I am certainly in the latter half of my career, and I am the mother of two adult young women. So um, how do we as current women leaders help our young women today achieve leadership positions and succeed in those in what is a probably different landscape when we entered and an ever-changing landscape? Great question, great question. And I have two young, you know, relatively young daughters, uh, both career women and already in the workplace. So uh, these are conversations that I have with them regularly and many other women. Um, first and foremost, I think having lots of good conversations and exposure, women need exposure to other women to watch them and talk about the leadership opportunities, what you see, what is provided to you, have good, open, candid conversations about these things. And when you make decisions, um, I think it's just really important to think a few steps ahead of that decision. What are you trying, what do you really want to do? This is not just for women, it's for anybody. What do you really want to be building here? And it's not the next step, it's four steps down the road. What is that gonna look like? And how are you going to be comfortable with what you've created? There's, there's definitely gonna be forks in the road and some people are better with change than other people. I think a big part as a mother 
is to just be extremely supportive as a mother or a mentor, extremely supportive and be willing to listen candidly. I have a, two very different children. One is very entrepreneurial and I love that. But at the same time, it drives me crazy because I fear for her because she takes risks that, you know, sometimes I guess my banker hat comes on. I go, oh my gosh. So I actually had to, I, I was very fortunate because I have a friend who's a really good entrepreneur and willing to be a mentor. And so I kind of set them up, kind of set them up on their own date and they have their own little world. But, I, you know, my daughter really didn't want to hear it from me, but she likes to hear it from someone else. If Megan talked to Kathleen, anything Kathleen said, she would be all ears. I might say the same thing and she doesn't hear it in the same way. So um, I, I just am always trying to give women lots of information, lots of encouragement. I, I do believe you have to use your voice and women in particular, you've got to use your voice and then you, you'll get that next opportunity. Thank you. Um, great answer, Adria. My parents regularly ask me a question. And when I was in my twenties and thirties, I, I moved around a lot. I had um, four years in one place, five years in one place, three years in one place. And the question they regularly asked wasn't what my professional goal was, wasn't was I happy with my job, my day-to-day -day life and what it entailed. It was, am I happy? And I think that's in some ways the most important question um, a mom, dad, parental figure can ask because like Adria says, I, I might not listen to the advice that my parents give me the same way I would as someone either in my industry, a different industry, someone that I view as a definition of success at that time. Um, but making sure, even if I say, oh, why do you always ask me that? I might not answer it for them, but I do reflect on it. And um, changes in career path, changes in life, um, they're not forever. You can make a different decision. And they've always given me the freedom to carve that path. And mine's been rather zigzaggy and they have always just made sure that I'm true to my, my own values, my own integrity and my definition of, of happiness. I think it's great you're asking the question. And make sure to teach them how to change tires and spark plugs and basic electric and all of those things too. <laughs> Absolutely, great answer. I have to, I just have to chime in that always, all of us, if we always try to serve ourselves to be happy, we're gonna just make the world a better place, period. I, I really believe that. And it's a great question to always be asking your kids, but your friends, everybody, are you happy? Are you really happy? And change what's not making you happy. Move from there. I just wanna take this time to thank all of you so much. Thanks to all who are here with us today. Um, and thank you to our panelists and moderator, Chief Spell, Adria, and Kathleen. Um, you know, as young women, as young women, I want you to know that I speak on probably everybody on this call that we're watching you, we're learning from you, and we just thank you for all that you're doing and for your time today. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll just close with a few brief announcements for everybody. Um, you should know that our applications are coming up for Leadership Collier and they will close on April 16th, so a week from today. So if there's anybody that you have in mind that you would love to see uh, be an applicant, please send them to our website or talk with me. I also want you to know for all of our alumni on the call that we will be happily graduating our classes of Associate Leadership Collier and Leadership Collier um, in the wide open spaces of the new Arthrex facility on May 27th. And hopefully someday we can also go back to Artist Naples. We've loved being at Artist Naples for so long and we hope to be back someday. So we're graduating actually the classes of 2020 and 2021. So we're really grateful to be at Arthrex and thank them for supporting us. Um, you can see all of the details on what that event will look like on our website. And I believe that is it. So I, I'm seeing all sorts of great compliments to our speakers. And again, thank you for your time. Thanks all of you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank Thanks you. For all Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.